Amen. So here we go. Uh, we've been, I wasn't talking about some things, uh, some Sunday morning, the Lord's uh, kind of mixed it up on us a little bit. Uh, but I really feel impressed in my heart to continue to talk about our fruitfulness and how God wants us to be fruitful and not just only when you think it's good. Isaac sowed his seed in a time of famine, not in the time when it was good. When everyone else was looking around and saying, why is the man so crazy? It hasn't rained. The ground is cracked. Don't he, don't, doesn't he recognize there's not a farmer out here that's sowing his seed? Why would he do something so stupid and waste his money? Listen to this. Why would he waste his money to put seed in the ground that's not going to produce? See, God takes the foolish things and he'll confound the wise. Let me tell you, it may seem like it's not the right time to do a lot of things, but when God says it's time, it's time to do all things. Amen? Uh, so that's what you have to understand. It's not always going to make sense. That's the rough part about being a leader visionary because sometimes what you say and what you want to do won't always make sense because not everybody see what you see. It's just simple. They just don't see what you see. And we surely don't see how God sees it. God has to work with us to see what he sees. So Isaac gets out there in the time of famine, sows his seed, and in the same year, reaps a hundredfold. And he got so blessed that it said his enemies, the Philistines, envied him. And then he dug out his father's wells. If you remember, he dug them out and the enemy filled them back in. Dug more, filled them back in. Then he dug another one and they filled it in. Then he dug one. And it, and it was good. And he said, the Lord, uh, he talked about the Lord has made us fruitful in a land of adversity. So even when you're in adverse times, God will make you fruitful. You don't have to be in the best times. You don't have to be, just like, you know, people talk about, well, the stock market's been good this past year and it has been good. And they said, there's a bull market. You know, there's a bull market where everything is good. This is when you want to get into it. Uh, but uh, when, it's, when it's not a bull market, you got to stay away from it. Let me tell you what. If the market is liquid, when one, peop when, when, when one person is losing, somebody else is gaining. It doesn't disappear. God knows exactly how the whole system works. Amen. He knows how the whole system works. And what's foolish to the natural mind, God can make it work out on your behalf. But you've got to decide, it doesn't matter what I'm going through. It doesn't matter what is before me. I am not going to live barren in a land where God said I can be fruitful. Why would you want to live barren in a land that God says you can be fruitful? The only reason why Christians are not fruitful, it is because they choose not to sow their seed when God says, sow here. Now, I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about everything else we do. Whatever God tells us to do, you have got to stay focused and be obedient to God. And he will cause you to prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. So when you look on down, uh, your seed can be sown. And you can find these stories starting at Genesis 17 on through uh, in the 20s. And you can find that story where he sowed his seed in the time of famine. And then he said, God has, God has made a place for us in this land. And he's blessed us and empowered us uh, and made us fruitful in the land of adversity. So uh, the next thing I want us to do, I want you to turn to the book of Genesis chapter 37. Yeah. And we're going to talk about a man called Joseph. Joseph can be a type and shadow of Jesus Christ and the things that he went through. Uh, Joseph was a, Joseph had the favor of God on him. Not only did Joseph have favor with God, Joseph had favor with his daddy. You know, and uh, his 11 brothers didn't like it. Uh, they, they didn't like it at all. He didn't like it. So, uh, you know, his father made him a special coat that his brother envied because he was born, you know, th the time he was born and, and uh, some son of his old age besides Benjamin. And uh, the this, this brothers didn't like him. You know, people talking about dysfunctional families. There's never been a family since Adam and Eve that hasn't been dysfunctional. It's just that most people learn how to function in dysfunctionality. But ever, there's, uh, there's not, uh, talking about dysfunctional, you know, people said, well, you know, you got to have classes on uh, dysfunctional families. And you got to have one class because I don't know a family that doesn't have some kind of activity that's not dysfunctional. Come on. You got families that look at other families saying I would never live like that. And they're looking at you, you're saying, you must be out of your mind living like that. 
So everybody has got something. And if, you, and if you're not dysfunctional, of course, we all know we're perfect, but you know you got relatives that are dysfunctional. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. So uh, you are dysfunctional, but thank God he makes us functional. Amen? Amen. So even when we are not all put together, God can make us look like everything is going to be all right. And so even you're talking about Jesus, no one has had more of a split than he's had. He had one person that was in the high ranks of of, of hierarchy of angels called Lucifer. And Lucifer wasn't satisfied being an archangel, a covering cherub who had high rank authority in heaven. He wasn't satisfied where he was at. So he said, I I, I want to have my throne above God's throne. And God has this big family of angels and Lucifer managed to take one third of them. So, if you, so there's not a pastor out there that's ever been through a church split or anything like that that God doesn't know what it's like because Lucifer split one third off of his camp. From the, from the beginning, Adam, Cain and Abel, dysfunctional. And then you got, then he, and then he, uh, uh, then God destroys the earth and he, he saves Noah. Ham, Sham, and Japheth, and uh, it becomes dysfunctional. As soon as Noah gets off, he celebrates. His grapes got <laughs> fermented. He gets drunk. Whatever, whatever Ham did, he got cursed. Dysfunctional. It just kept going on. As long as there's human with the sin nature... There's going to be an element of being dysfunctional. Amen. And that's what I'm telling you. You don't have to be perfect to get God to work in your life. You just have to keep a pure heart. That's true. Amen. Amen. So here we have another dysfunctional family. We have Jacob. Jacob was messed up from the beginning. I mean, he, he, he's the one that taunted his brother Esau. Taunted him. Stole his birthright. Didn't really steal it. Esau was foolish not to give it away for a bowl of beans. But, uh, but he played the game with his mother to, de- to deceive his father Isaac. And then you have all of this stuff going on here. So now, so now we see the things that are happening. So verse, th- uh, verse 1 of the 37. Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. This is a story of Jacob's. Uh, Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of, of Bilhi, the sons of and the sons of uh, Zilpah, his father's wives. He had those two wives, remember? And Joseph brought a bad report to them, or better, brought a bad report of them to his father. So, tattletale. Isn't that what it is? Joseph the tattletale. But the tattletale had an awesome coat that his dad made him. So this is the man, but here's the point. God's hand was up on this kid. And he started having dreams. Brother, that they didn't like. Let me tell you a dream. You all bowed down and worshiped me. You know what they wanted to do over a dream? Kill him. Kill him. You know, you gotta be, you gotta watch who you tell your dreams to. You gotta watch who you tell your dreams to. They can get you stoned. Maybe not literally. I remember the day that uh, you know, I've always heard at Rama, Brother Hagen taught us when we were there as students. It's been so many years ago now. I can still hear his voice though. Uh been thirty some <clears throat> years ago now since uh we graduated, right, Albert? Uh, so, but he's talked about protecting the anointing, protect the anointing, protect the anointing at all costs. Don't let somebody mess with the anointing, protect the anointing. And some people took it to the extreme. 
you know, took the extreme. Like, here's the extreme that they say. You know, now we don't have an exit to this door here. You got to come to this door to get in that door. But they would sneak into this door and go to this door. Didn't want anybody to touch him because until it was time to welcome him to the platform. Because if you touch him or talk to him, you may mess with the anointing and he may not be able to deliver. Let me tell you, if somebody has a question that's going to mess my anointing up, then something's wrong anyway. Jesus was thronged. People, he didn't even know who touched him and still had the anointing to set people free. Somebody touching me and talking to me, uh, now I prefer you not rebuking me and, and telling me I'm the most sorry preacher you've ever seen before I preach. That, that's a little bit of a downer. But outside of that, it's not too bad to talk to people before service. But you know, you got to protect the anointing and you can't be around people. As soon as you're done, you got to, you got to, you got to shishay right off the side because, you know, you got to make sure you decompress properly. And so people took it too far. But one day God began to deal with me about vision. And I started sharing with people about the vision God put in my heart. And it was amazing on how this person just trampled all over it. And I was heartbroken. I thought they would rejoice with me, Don. I thought they would say, uh, young man, I'm telling you, God's hand is upon you. Instead of looking at me like, uh, you don't know a thing you're doing. And not like they were having a lot of fruit in their ministry, but, but they really crushed my heart. And I remember walking out and I, was, I walked out of this door. It was this visible. I turned to the right. And I turned to the left to get into my car. It was that visible. And then the word of the Lord said, you remember how you were taught to protect your anointing? Now do the same thing with your vision. Be very careful who you share this with because people will not understand and they will not appreciate it. Joseph didn't go to Ramah. He wasn't able to be taught on how to protect your anointing. Or protect your vision. So he started having these dreams and he was called a dreamer. And so then, so the one dream wasn't enough to call, to one of his brothers to have to kill him. Uh, he had another dream that the moon and the star, I mean, the, 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 the sun and the moon bowed down to him. That's the mom and dad and the stars, they all bowed down. And the dad said, you know, uh, uh, and his brother envied him. Verse 11 said, his brothers envied him, but the father kept the manner in his mind. He, he knew that this is not, is this may not be normal, but this may not be wrong either. Okay, so look at verse 12. Then his brothers went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, remember Jacob's name was changed to what? Israel. That's why from everybody after that is called the children of Israel. So uh, it was Jacob until he wrestled with the angel the night that he was leaving Laban's house, his father-in-law, and he had the blessing. This is where it gets to you. I'm going to give you another sermon within a sermon. Uh, God blessed Jacob. Jacob had the blessing of God up on him. The blessing was not something that was visible to the five senses. The blessing is something that's, that's, uh, that your, the five senses can't, can't mess with. And uh, Jacob never could settle in his heart that he was blessed because he was a trickster, he lied, he was a deceiver type person and he never could embrace. See, when you're not honest with yourself and honest with people, when God starts moving on your life, you'll have a hard time in embracing this God upon on you because you can only see yourself the way you used to act. That's why you have to get things back in control of your life if they're out of control and allow the forgiveness of God and allow the restoration of God to be upon you so when God starts using you, you won't have to say, oh my God, I'm not worthy of this. I'm just not worthy of this. I'm just not worthy because he has made you worthy, not because you're good, but because of his blood. Amen. But don't be foolish to mess around with God's anointing. In, in essence, don't be foolish by, by living right one day and living foolish the next. You know, a blessing this day and cursing the next. You can't live that way. You have to live honest. And so Jacob, you know, there was, I've, I've, I've told this story. And I, I remember when, when uh, there was a book out called The God Chasers. And I, I read this book and I heard the guy that wrote it spoke. And uh, he made statements. And it became a statement all through the revival realm. And that is, never trust a man without a limp. Because the day that Jacob came out of his father-in-law's house, 
uh, Laban's house. And then he knew that Esau was there to kill him. And he came to the river that night and there he wrestled with an angel. How many knows the story? He wrestled with an angel and uh, the angel says, let me go. And he says, not until you Bless me. But see, God blessed him because even his mother, the, the, spirit, the, the Lord spoke to her and said that the elder shall serve the younger. The younger's the one that was blessed. He already had the blessing on him. He already had the dream of Jacob's ladder where the angels were ascending the descending. And God told him that I have blessed you. I've empowered you. The blessing is not connected with your five senses. It's the supernatural touch of God on your life. It's what God said to Adam when he created him. He blessed them and said, be fruitful. They couldn't be fruitful without the blessing. The blessing is what makes you fruitful. And so Jacob already had this blessing, but because he saw himself as the old way, he could not embrace, even though he saw the results of it in Laban's house, he still couldn't except the results of it. And so that day, he wrestled with the angel until his hip was out of joint, until the day that he died. And he said, bless me. I'm not letting you go till you bless me. And the angel says, what's your name? He said, Jacob. He said, not anymore. From this day forth, your name shall be called Israel. And see, he wouldn't have had to have that hip out of joint if he would have embraced by faith that he was blessed, but he couldn't see it because of his prior life. So let me tell you, why is it important for you to live right? So you can embrace what God has for you today and you won't judge yourself after yesteryears. Amen. It's the blessing. This was Israel and Israel, the blessed one. The blessed one said to Joseph, are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to him, here am I. And he said to him, please go and see if it's well with your brothers and well with the flocks and bring word back to me. Go tattle again. No, <laughs> bring word back to me. So he sent him out to go check. Now, verse 15 says, now a certain man found him. Now, how many has watched this movie, watched this thing on TV about Joseph? And, and uh, th there's, there's a movie about uh, Esau and Jacob and, and uh, Joseph in Israel. I mean, in Egypt. Anybody ever, ever see those movies on the television? When he was thrown into a pit and there were snakes in the pit and he's cuddled up, he's huddled up in the bottom of the pit. Anybody ever see that movie? Uh, it's sad. Don't worry about it. Uh, <clears throat> It had an element of truth, but it was pretty off. Okay, so this man, uh, a certain man f found him and uh, saw him wandering in the fields, it says. And the man asked him, saying, uh, who, what are you seeking for? Who are you seeking for? He said, I'm seeking for my brothers. Please tell me where they are feeding their flocks. And he says, they have now headed towards this place called Dothan. And now when he, they were on their way to Dothan, and that's when they saw. They didn't recognize the boy, but they recognized the coat. Here comes the dreamer. And listen to this family of love. Let's kill him. Let's kill him. And one of common sense, so we can't kill him and have his blood up on our hands. Let's put him in a pit. And not only did he put him in a pit, how I many knows that was a bad day? You come to see your brothers. You know, David says, it's not the one that, it wasn't my enemy that did me wrong. It was the one I went to the house of the Lord with that did me wrong. Folks, the world has never pierced my heart the way some of the church has. When I went through things in my life, the world is not the one who told me I was done. I'll never preach again. And, you know, things that, you know, you, you don't deserve it. It was the Christians. It wasn't the world. It was the spiritual Sanhedrin. The holy righteous. The world will keep you in check, though, because even the world will say, no, you shouldn't be talking this way. Christians don't talk like that. Christians don't act that way. Even they know. 
So there are some things you ought to listen to them. At least they know that. But David said it was the one I went to the house of the Lord with that cut my heart. And so his brother says, let's, uh, let's kill him. They said, no, we can't do that. And so what happened was that uh, they took him and threw him into an empty pit. Say empty pit. Yes. Television said there were snakes in there. This says empty. I'll take this over the television. But they had to make a movie. They had to make a movie. And there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat the meal. They lifted their eyes and looked, behold, a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels, bearing spices, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry them down to Egypt. And Judah said, his brother, uh, Judah was one of his brothers, so Judah said to his brothers, what profit is there that we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites that his blood may not be up on our hands. And so what they did, they sold him to the Ishmaelites. Verse 28, uh, it says, Then the Midianite traders passed by so that the brothers pulled Joseph and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. So this 20 shekels of silver, it was the price for a slave. Now, I also read, you know, if Joseph being a foreshadow of this, uh, you look at it now from the times of Jesus, uh, that uh, the 30 shekels or 30 pieces of silver was about equivalent to the 20 in the days of Joseph. And so they sold him into this slavery, sold him out. But I'm trying to just kind of go th through this story here and sold him f for this. So how many knows life is not getting any better? So you wake up in the morning. Hello, son. Hello, father. Hey, son, I'm going to set you on. I'm going to put you on an assignment. What is that, dad? I want you to go down to Shechem. Your brothers are down there feeding the flocks. We had to move the flocks down there. They're feeding the flocks. And, and uh, you know, uh, there's no cell towers down there. And Verizon's not getting a very good connection. So I want you to go in down there and check on your brothers and uh, bring me back word of what's going on. Yes, sir, father. I'm going to do, I'm going to, to do that. Now, in the movie... On television, even they did get somewhat right. I think the part of the movie says, now remember your brothers don't like you very well, so make sure you keep yourself right. But there doesn't say all that story in here. But anyway, he goes down there and he's looking for his brothers and they're not there, but a man shows up and he says, uh, who are you looking for? I'm looking for my brothers. They, sh they were supposed to be grazing around here, the flocks. He said, oh yeah, they went to Dothan. And there they show up in Dothan, and, and, uh, and so things are going pretty good. You know, I thought they were here, but they're over there. And then they yell out, here comes that dreamer. Now, let me tell you something about it. This wasn't just brotherly spat. This was murder in their hearts. Hatred is murder, and this hatred was going to turn into murder. So let me tell you, just you think you're having a bad day because somebody posted something bad about you? This... Whatever spirit that was hijacking these brothers were wanting to kill him. It wasn't to kill the boy with the pretty coat. It was to kill the plan of God's deliverance for his people. So even when God puts you on an assignment and things don't go well, you can't afford to quit. You've got to learn how to be fruitful in adversity and you've got to learn how to be fruitful in affliction. You can't quit. Now, there's times I wanted to change jobs. I told you that this past year. I said I never wanted to quit ministry, quit preaching. I just wanted to change jobs, man. I felt like everybody was bored with me. Nobody was responding. Who cared? So I'm thinking, dear Lord, when I made this statement, angel says, quit saying it that way. I'm going back to the world. No, you're not going back to the world, to the nations. Say the nations. I wouldn't even end the world like that. How can I go back? Uh, but anyway, there's times you want to quick change jobs, but you never want to change God's. You never want to change the purpose. So they sold him and they took Joseph and then they killed a goat and put his coat down in it and came back to his father and says, oh, we found this on the way. <laughs> Is this your son's coat? As if they didn't know. Come on, tell me. 
This was their brothers in the family. Do you, you think you're not going to meet people in the church this way? Is this your son's coat? Oh my God, a wild animal must have ate him and this is the blood on it. And, he, and King James said he covered himself with sackcloth and ashes and, and he fell down and he wept and no one could comfort him. I wonder how they felt seeing what they did to their father but because they had hatred in their heart. You know what the Bible says in 1 John? It says, how can you say you love a God that you have never seen and hate your brother who you do see? How can you say that? I, I remember saying, I, I remember a long time ago making a decision. I can tell how much you really love God because to the amount that you love someone that you can see, it really determines on how much you love you have for someone who you can't see. Because if you can't love a brother who you see, how can you say you love a God that you can't even see? Come on. How can you say you, you love a brother that you can see? How, how can you say you love a God you can't see and you can't even love your own brother that you look at? When the love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost in God. This word love has got really messed up in the body of Christ. Jesus said, don't even think it's special just because you do good to somebody who's done good to you. Even the world does that. But love those who despitefully use you, that reject you. That's the true love of God. Amen. Do good to other people. We came out, we was at Brother Copeland's and we were all together. The reference was there and... Uh, Shannon was there, and these people were wanting something. I don't know. It was not something that I needed. But I gave them, I had a $5 bill, and I gave it to them to help them. I don't want anything. Don't send me nothing right there. And I said, that's, that's a Galatians 6 opportunity. I use that word. That's a Galatians 6 opportunity. What's a Galatians 6? Do, do good to all men. Express you to the household of faith. I'm going to get blessed for being good to all men, but I'm going to really, I'm really obligated to the household of faith. Amen. There's nothing wrong with being a blessing to someone. Do good to all men. He didn't say just to the saved. Because he said do good to all, especially to the household of faith. You know, we ought to love one another. I made this statement some months back, or, you know, right at the first year, months back. Right at the first year. We're still in January. It seemed longer than that. It might have been go going into it, but uh, when everything was paid off, I said we're out of debt except for one thing. We're forever going to be indebted to love one another. Oh, no man, nothing but to love him. So we may, buildings may be paid off, but you're forever, ever, ever in debt to love one another. You're forever in debt to love one another. So anyway, uh, they took the coat and they put it in blood and uh, they gave it to their, their father and then they, he fell apart. Well, they brought Joseph down and they sold Joseph, a guy named Potiphar, bought Joseph. Uh, and uh, then all of a sudden, I don't want to get too far ahead. Uh, this Potiphar, uh, this, well, let's, let's just look at 39. And Joseph had been taken down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer, I wanted to scoot, scoot over to 40, but I better read this. An officer of Pharaoh's captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. And the Lord, the Lord was with Joseph and he was a prosperous man or God made him to prosper. God made him to succeed. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, say with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. How many would like to be one of those people? Have that in your hand, that everything you touch, you prosper in your hand? Come on. Can you imagine? Let me tell you, Joseph could have boarded all of this. You're saying, how can God keep doing Let me tell you how I know that Joseph's heart stayed right because God kept blessing him. Could you imagine that the only people made it to the promised land, out of all the people who came out of Egypt, not even Moses. It was just Caleb and Joshua. Only two. 
Rest of them died in the wilderness. Their carcass laid there. Why? Because they murmured and complained. So that tells me if everybody laid in the wilderness because they murmured and complained, then not one time that Joshua and Caleb got caught or was counted guilty of murmuring and complaining. That's not a very good statistic, is it? When you have all those people and all of them died in the wilderness because they murmured and complained, but two men that did not murmur and complain, Joshua and Caleb, made it to the other side, not even Moses. If anybody deserved to make it in there after pastoring that bunch, it should have been Moses. But not even Moses, Joshua and Caleb made it. The rest of them died because they did what? Murmured and complained. Can God bless that? No. So that tells me for God to continue to promote Joseph through all of this, he kept his heart right. Say, kept his heart right. You know how God's going to continue to promote you? Is when you keep your heart right. You know what the enemy's going to try to do? Mess with your heart. Why? Because out of the abundance of the heart, out of the, out of the heart, everything else flows. G- Proverbs says, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the forces of life, the issues of life. So if the enemy can mess with your heart, if a seed of bitterness can come out of your heart, it's going to mess with everything else. It will mess with all the pureness of the waters that flows out of it. Keep your heart protected. Keep your heart protected. Uh, I wrote down here in my Bible. I wrote down in my Bible so I don't forget it. It said, it said in his master Saul that the Lord was with him and that God made all that he did to prosper in his hand. I wrote down, he never got bitter. How could you be abused like that and never get bitter? Amy, I wish I had the testimony that I've never allowed people to bitter my heart. I really do. I like to tell you that you have a pastor that's never allowed his heart to get bitter on something. Every every challenge I faced, I didn't get bitter, always got better. But I had allowed things to mess with it. I've had, I have allowed things to make the waters bitter. And you have to have the healing power of God to make them better. Come on, but aren't you glad healing power of God? Even in, even in bitter waters, God knew how to make them sweet again. God knows how to make that bitterness sweet inside of you again. We've all gone through things. And I thought, what kind of man really is this? Where the spirit of God did not dwell in him, just came upon him. And we have the Holy Ghost in us. And people with the Holy Ghost in them still have a hard time to keep bitterness out of their well. But I'm going to tell you, Joseph kept being promoted, not because he was perfect. I believe because he kept his heart right. He kept his heart right. There was no bitter. So Joseph found favor in his sight, in, in Potiphar's sight, and served him. And he made him overseer of his house and all that he had put under his authority, put everything in his authority. So it was from that time that, and it was from that time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for whose sake? Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Look at this. Because of how Joseph lived, it blessed the house of the Egyptian. Let me tell you. If the church is the salt of the world, then we are the ones going to make the difference. We're the ones that's going to make the difference. Through all of this, God still blessed him. God still blessed him. God still blessed him. God. And then all of a sudden, trouble shows up in the form of a woman. There's nothing doctrinal about that. It's just part of the story. So f- the Bible says, uh, uh, even in the, in, the, in the New King James, Joseph was handsome in the form of his appearance. And Pharaoh's wife set eyes on him. Set eyes on him. And she said to him, come lie with me. Wasn't very subtle, was it? Come lie with me. Come lie with me. Come lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, in verse 8, 
Look, my master does not know what, what is with me in this house. He has committed all that he has into my hands. There is no one greater in his house than I, nor has he kept back, nor, there's no, hang on. Uh, I almost went to a different verse here. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you. Because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He didn't say sin against his master. He said sin against God. Sin against God. So it was as she spoke to Joseph day by day, say day by day, day by day, day by day, that he did not heed still. I love that. Day by day, come live with me. Day by day, I'm here. Day by day, hey, hey, right over here. That's what he did. That's what she did. But it happened about the time when Joseph went out into the house to do work and none of the men of the house was inside and she caught him by his garments. She caught him by his garments saying, this is the time. Let's go, lie with me. But he left his garments in her hand and he fled and ran outside. And so she said, here's my point. I'm so angry that he won't. I always get my way. I always get my way. Except for him. And then she screams, and everybody comes running. Look what my husband did, brought this Hebrew in here. Look what he's done. He's violated me. He shamed me. And Potter, for who trusted him. If you trusted this guy this much, wouldn't you ask what really happened? But even, don't even find out the conversation he had. It said he was angered after the story of his lying wife and put him into prison. Put him into prison. Put him into prison. Put him into prison. Say prison. prison. Verse 21, and the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. And he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison com committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not look at to anything, just like Potiphar. Look at this. Lied about put in prison and look what God kept doing. Would you say he kept his heart right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you think he's having good days? So all of a sudden, uh, Pharaoh has two of his main employees, the butler and the baker. They get put into prison. It's a bad day for all of them. And the two of them had dreams. Two separate dreams. And they woke up and disturbed about the dreams. You know the story. You've been reading it, right? It's the first of the year. You've already read these stories. So it's good that we go through it. And so they both had dreams and they didn't know what to do. And Joseph came in and saw their countenance sad. He said, what's going on? He said, we both had dreams and we don't know what, what to do. We don't have anybody that can interpret. He said, tell me. Lay it on me. So the butler, he said, okay, your dream is simple. He says, uh, the grape that you see, uh, they will be squeezed back into the cup of the king and you will give the king, his, the, the pharaoh, his cup again and he will restore you to that position. So the baker's thinking, man, this is a good, I have good words are being passed out. I want a good word. But all of a sudden, it wasn't so good for the baker. He said, no, all of the, all of the goods on your head in that basket that the birds are plucking, that's gonna be you. You're gonna hang and the birds are gonna pick your flesh off your bones. But he, wasn't, he didn't like that interpretation. We like good prophecies. Thus saith the Lord, a new house is coming to you. More money. Things are good, but not you're going to die. That's not very good words. But anyway, and Joseph said, all I'm asking you is don't forget me. And it just happened just like he said. But the next thing you know, Pharaoh had a dream. Pharaoh had a dream. Now this is the part that we're going to get to. We're coming to an end here. You like storytelling 101 tonight? Here's the part that we're gonna like. So Pharaoh had a dream. What was the dream? He had two dreams, one about cows and one about grain. He saw coming out of the river seven fat cows. Fat cows. And they were grazing, everything was good. And up out of the same river came seven weak, frail, anemic, ugly cows. And all of a sudden, they were weak and meek. And, and all of a sudden, the, the weak, skinny, scrawny cows ate the, 
big cows, but they never got fat. They just devoured them. He woke up sweating. What in the world is this? And so the second dream, he saw these grains of, these grains of corn, seven full, lush grains. And then he saw these maciated grains of corn. And then the other, the, the wheat grain, ate the full grains, but yet nothing changed. And he's tormented by it. He called the magicians in there, interpret this dream, and they put their potions and did this and all that other stuff going on, and nobody could interpret it. And then so the butler says, uh, there's a sin I've committed. There's a man in prison. And it happened to be on a day when I and my baker friend were in there. We both had dreams, and this man interpreted it and it happened just exactly like he said. And I stand before you with a cup because... His interpretation was right. He said, go get this, Joseph. Go get this, Joseph. And so they brought him. He shaved him and put him in the clothes and brought him before him. And says, he says, I had a dream. He says, he said, I heard you can interpret. He said, I can't, but only God. God's the interpreter of all dreams. He said, tell me the dream. And he told him a dream about the cattle, the fat and the lean. And then he told him a dream about the, the, the grain, the full and the, and the, uh, the, the weak. And he says, this is what's going to happen. There's going to be seven years of abundance. There's going to be seven years of abundance. Then there's going to be seven years of famine. The two dreams are one. And the famine will be so bad it will consume. It will consume the seven years of plenty. It will consume the seven years of plenty. And he says, uh, and a Pharaoh would pick out a man of wisdom, 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 let me use the words in the book of Acts, full of wisdom, the Holy Ghost, and of good report. Find a man with this kind of wisdom that one-fifth of all the grain of Egypt would be stored back for the seven years. So once the seven years is over, when the plight hits and the famine hits and everything is done, that uh, you'll still have grain in Egypt. And he says, who would be greater than the man from whence this wisdom came from? Joseph, out of all of your sorrow, out of all of your heartache, out of all of your torment, from the pit to the palace, it doesn't matter. You didn't get bitter, you kept getting better. Even when the woman lied on you in prison, you still got exalted. Even when, even when you were forgotten in prison, you were brought here. The only thing that's gonna separate you from me is this throne. The only thing that's gonna separate you is this throne. And he says, you will be the one no man will pick up a foot in this country until your word says so. Now, do you think Joseph, when he was in that pit, he thought he would be here? Do you think Joseph, when he was in the prison, he thought he'd be there? You notice that from the time he came out of that pit, even in Potiphar's house, did, did, did he begin to be fruitful? Yes, everything he touched prosper. But was it taken away from him? Yes, by this woman. He was put into prison. Did he begin to be fruitful? So was he fruitful even in prison? Yes. 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 And even when, even when he said, don't forget me, people forgot him. How many times you told somebody, don't forget me, and they still forgot you, and bitterness comes up inside of you? But he kept walking with God. He kept, see, it's important for us to be fruitful, but you've got to play by the rules. You've got to walk in love. You've got to keep your heart right to be fruitful. And uh, verse 446, Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh. Jesus was 30 years old when he started his supernatural works too. And all of a sudden, It happened just like he said. And so Pharaoh gave him a wife. She gave him, he gave him a wife. Now look at verse 51. Joseph, Joseph had a wife and then he had two sons. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manassas for God had made him forget all his toil and his father's house. So it tells me that he had toil, didn't he? It made him forget it. The name of the second one was called Ephraim. Oh, I love this story. You go over to chapter 50, this story here make you shout. The second born was called Ephraim. 
for God had caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. So let me tell you, Joseph said, even in the land of his affliction, God still caused him to be fruitful. Now, I'm not just talking about fruit of your loins. He was fruitful in everything. In the time of adversity, you've still got to know how to be fruitful. In a time of affliction, you still got to know how to be fruitful. Everything, the seasons don't have to be right. Everything doesn't have to be right for you to be fruitful. Somewhere down the line, we're going to have to start seeing harvest in a time of famine. In a time of a country that we're in where it looks like there's spiritual famine all around us, somebody's going to have to rise up and allow God to be seen through them. We can't just become a product of our environment. We've got to set the temperature of it. We've got to set the temperature of what's going on. I've made a decision. You know, I started doing this back, uh, started doing this back like on uh, uh, the week before December the 18th. So I've been talking about this. I had these verses all down. And I've decided going into this year, not only is it going to be the year of God's favor, this is a year that I'm planning on being fruitful like I've never been fruitful before. How many wants to be fruitful like you've never been fruitful before? But you can't just be fruitful when, when you think things are right. You got to be fruitful even when things are not right. Even when it looks like it's a good time to sow, it doesn't look like it's a good time to sow. Sow, sow, sow. 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 Those people lied on me. They put me in prison. Well, what, what, what are you going to do in prison? You better rise to the top. You better keep flowing in the Holy Ghost and interpreting and knowing what's going on because you got to know I'm coming out of here. I'm coming out of here. Well, where are you going when you come out of here? I'm going to be in a higher position coming out than I was going in. I'm going to be in a better position coming out than I was going in. See, God can change your position and God can take you places you've never dreamed if you don't allow the enemy to steal it out of your heart. If you don't allow the enemy to steal it out of your heart. There's things about this story I just love to tell. You, you're looking at a man that even said, this man called Joseph. He not only was a deliverer to Egypt, but he was a deliverer to his own brother's and sisters, and you know, outside of the storm, the famine came, just as it was said, the moon and the sun, and all the stalks bowed down before him, bowed down before him. But even when he brought his family and put them into the nicest, plushest place of Egypt called Goshen, and in bondage 430 years, he told them, even though this place has been good, here's how it's going to work. I love this. He says, when, you, when God delivers you out of here, don't even let my bones stay in this country. I may have been an icon. I may have been the prime minister, but you don't even leave my bones in this country. He told him right before the start, you get me out of here. You get me out of this place. And just like Joseph's brother, Joseph's father, Israel, Jacob, where the younger was going to rule over the elder and the elder would serve the younger. You'll find this in chapter 50. It's going to be the same way that even though Manasseh was the firstborn and then Ephraim, when Ephraim was born, it says, now God has caused me to be fruitful and made me forget all of my afflictions. When Jacob laid hands to bless his sons, Jacob put the right hand on the younger and he says, this is the one that's going to carry it on. And notice this. It was the one he said, God has made me forget my sorrow. And a time of adversity is the one that God had his hand on to keep going forward with the lineage. I'm telling you, if you let God be God, he will change your world forever. But you got to let God be God. So you got a choice. I've made this statement the last time. 
I wasn't here last Wednesday, but you got made this statement the last time. You've got to decide. I'm going to get, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get better. I'm going to get better. I've made a statement here. I was just, uh, I was still on the elder board. I wasn't, I, was, I think I was still the associate at the time. And um, I didn't realize there were some things going on with some of the people on the board that, that I think at the conversation with dad afterwards, I didn't know that he was trying to get a point across. Uh, we was in a board meeting down in the fellowship hall. And, and I mean, that meeting, everything that was being said, Linda, it was starting to offend me. I was starting to get offended. Because I made a statement some weeks before that. I've made my mind up. I'm never going to get offended again. You know, the Bible says in Psalms that we ought to live to where nothing shall offend us. It is true. You, you, you can live an offense-free life. And, uh, but uh, I made the statement. I hadn't fed up on, hadn't built my faith on it all the way yet. But I mean, I'm confessing. And we get in this board meeting and dad making statements, you know. And, and I'm thinking, man, I don't know. I felt like he was just talking to me, only me. And uh, I remember making a statement. I said, I got something I want to say. Today, I refuse to be offended. And he says, it had nothing to do with you. Well, I'm telling you what, to me, I felt it was all me. But the truth is, that day I made my mind up that I settled it. I wasn't going to be offended. And sometimes you got to say it out loud. You got to say it out loud. I'm not going to get bitter. I'm not going to live an offended life. I'm not going to allow the enemy to put me in prison. And then I keep myself there because God can't parole me because I'm blaming everybody and I'm offended by it. See, a lot of people could get out of prison or should have been out a long time ago. They should have been paroled by the goodness of God, but they kept their self in bondage because they didn't know how to keep offense at bay. That's true. Amen. So they kept herself chained. They kept herself chained. So if you want to get out... When it's your turn, just keep your heart right. Hey Amen. If the enemy can't bind your heart, he can't hold anything else in your life. He can't hold anything else. You can live victorious and free. Amen. All right. Well, let's stand.